talk about things and this spring's coming pretty soon now mm -hmm. you know so maybe things are getting better and uh, I really like the idea of public access don't you I really think public access is manna from heaven wonderful and I'm glad you're getting going yes, you know? yes. so we'll be talking about uh, what we can do and what the public access is. And welcome, welcome very much to Conversations, where it's a pleasure to welcome two of the stalwart members of the production team here at uh, the producers at MNN, and that being on my far left, Joshua Volinsky, who is a network extra networker extraordinaire, and that is completely true. Progressive, I think we particularly have it up as a progressive networker pro extraordinaire, and he's got a program that's developing here at MNN, and he's been around, he's got he knows more people in New York City than anybody else I know, and he has such a relationship with them. And Josh, you're so good to welcome you once again to Conversations, and uh, uh, along with Paul and Lori here, it's uh, really good. It's really very good to be here. Yeah. It's a wonderful atmosphere, and as usual, we invite everyone out in video land to come in and join us. Yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. And immediately, like Paula Gloria, she has the program refer farther down the rabbit hole that follows my program daily on Manhattan Network, and she's just a light onto the world in so many different kinds of ways. And Paula, welcome. It's so good to join here with J Joshua on the program. Thanks, Harold. So great to see you. Now, we started out talking about this program and about the state of the world and the public access and that sort of thing, and it originated from my having had a conversation with uh, Joshua about this idea, the appellate that's put upon him as being a progressive. And we were going to start to talk about what is it that constitutes, um, we, we can go off in other realms if you want, but what is it that constitutes and what do we mean when we talk about the progressive community in terms of understanding the human condition or the human condition within the evolution of universal consciousness. What does it mean to be a progressive? What are the hallmarks of a progressive mentality in your estimation? Because you are a networker among progressives. Yeah. Uh, and so what do you think, Joshua? Well, what does progressive connote to as you? As time goes on, I discover that what makes a progressive is a full human being, mm -hmm. a person who really delves in and indulges into the full human experience. Mm -hmm. And that's being sensitive, working with other people, listening to other people, listening to what they say, mm -hmm. whether you agree with them or not, mm -hmm. and trying to work with them and trying to understand also and visualize uh, what their problems are. Now, I could ask the audience a question. Mm -hmm. Social Security is 70 years old. I know. It's so starting if somebody is trying to change Social Security, uh -huh. like our administration is, mm -hmm. are the other people who are fighting for Social Security progressives, or are they conservatives? Uh -huh. Are they trying to conserve something we've had for 70 years interesting that yeah. works very well uh -huh. so uh, this is a very interesting that's concept. an interesting take on thing except i want to because uh, i this program is going to air the day after my 72nd birthday and i was born in 1935 and i mark it well because that's the year of social securities mm -hmm. instituting so really? it's 72 years not really? 70 years yeah. yeah right it started in 1935 and it's very interesting you frame it because that's an, they're trying to change that and does change connote, I mean, progressive cha change, any change or something, or there's things to be preserved? And that's really interesting. How about you? What do you think when you think of how do you get your value, where do we get our values from in terms of political and or larger understandings of the human condition and no, its I'm improvement? Just, I'm always excited by the brilliance of a spontaneous situation. Yeah. Like when we uh -huh. were talking how we were going to do the show. Yeah. Um, I had no idea that uh, Josh would bring up such a brilliant analogy. Yeah, that's good. That, yeah. that to conserve mm -hmm. Social Security that's been here for 70 years, and then you corrected him, 72. 72, yeah. Um, is, it, is it necessarily a good thing to change that? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that says it all. You think it and does? And it, it's uh -huh. coming up a lot with me because sometimes Harold, I'm, I mean, uh, Howard Stern people, they, they copy my show and then they play it on theirs okay. to sort of make fun that I do spiritual things and, and they you it do? seems a yeah. little goofy yeah. or silly. Uh -huh. And uh, 
in the interaction I had on the email because now we're pretty transparent about that. I uh -huh. kind of know what they're doing and they just come right out and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and connect. And they were looking through my postings on YouTube, and I have about 150 uh, shows up. 150 now. now? Yes, God. yes, yes. I wonderful, know. isn't it wonderful? So, so yeah. I, I have one that I really have to hand it to uh, to Howard Stern's gang. They picked up one that is one of my favorite. It's just about 10 minutes, yeah. and it's called "A Mean Berkeley Liberal and oh. My Super Brother George." Uh -huh. And this is when I went home to California. And I was driving down the road, and I had to go a little bit into the other side because of a big truck that was parked. Yeah. And I was used to courteous New York drivers. Oh, I, courteous New York drivers. Yeah. Cur courteous and intelligent New York yeah, drivers uh -huh. because I take my bicycle all around Manhattan. Oh, and you were on your bike. N in in yeah. Manhattan. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, so, I know. So I'm yeah. spoiled from, uh -huh. from the intelligence of how traffic flows in Manhattan. Uh -huh. So I just assumed when I moved over the, the center line in Berkeley, uh -huh. you know, filled with the liberals, mm -hmm. that, the <laughs> yes. that, that the other fellow would come the other way and sort of move over and give me space because yeah. he, had, he had no cars parked on his mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't believe it. This guy's coming at me, and for a moment, it's like our consciousness locks. Yeah. And it's like he's saying, he's not going to move over. And mm. I go, holy shit, this like guy's... Chicken. He's not yeah. Yeah, like chicken. Yeah, chicken. So, the game so I said, he's not going to move over. Mm. So I pulled my car over tighter towards the big... Uh, truck that, huh. that had lug nuts probably like this, yeah. and it just ripped the side off my mother's car, uh -huh. it just crunched. Wow. And the guy, he didn't, he didn't move an inch, he just goes sailing on behind me. Wow, it just kept going? So, so and it's all on YouTube, yeah. and I swear they, they picked up on it. And, uh -huh. they, and so they asked me, well, you're up at Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and you're one of those uh, liberals or progressives. Not. And I said, well, you know, actually not. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, that's how it comes well, up. Well, that's I am from Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, when Mario Savio was speaking, I was in high school, so I couldn't see him. And you grokked him I, then, or you? I, you no, you, it's like yeah. I had allergies, and I went to a girls' school, and I was in a uniform. But when my ride uh, would come through, you know, there were a couple of people that would, you know, one mother would pick up a couple kids. Yeah, sure, and then, right, right. I don't know, ride sharing thing. No. And when the tear gas was flowing, I was more sensitive than most. I was like the canary. Mm. I'd start sneezing. Mm -hmm. And my father, being that he was from Greece, he fought in World War II with right. the British, uh -huh. and he saw so much heartache in that part of the country, yeah. in part of the world, yeah. that he didn't want to hear anything against this um, country. So right, everything, okay, so yeah, everything right. I heard about. Um, you know the liberals who throw yourself on derogatory the to, yes, to say right, you know right. it's just uh -huh. it's just like mm -hmm. sandals he goes oh they don't even wear shoes and yeah. you know like that so uh -huh. I was brought up in a conservative way yeah my daddy was that way too yeah I know yeah. but so but he, you did so the liberal and, and that's the, okay the liberal yeah. got to be a bad word somehow in the political dialogue well I everything. noticed got to be, when you couldn't be a liberal because it was a nasty thing or something and mm -hmm. you know well, then, of course, there's radical. Uh, maybe radical was a very bad word, but when I started really listening to what was happening with Mario Savio and what happened with the free speech movement, I go, wow, mm -hmm. this was a whole lot different. Well, a precursor uh, to the whole Vietnam thing, uh, protesting yeah, to Vietnam. And, and he, he even had a slur about liberalism with, um, who was it, Clark Kerr. Yeah, he was, was the head of the, uh, yeah. uh, Chancellor. Remember the Freedom Universe? Under Clark Kerr? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Well, Berkeley's known for that, and it's known for being liberal yeah. or progressive. Yeah. So what is it? I was just a high school, pre high school, just listening to the music, I wanting know. to go to a love in. You know, yeah. the first time I got a driver's license, we gave a hippie a ride. He was mm -hmm. hitchhiking, mm -hmm. and we got a joint. And it's like, oh, what do mm -hmm. we do with this? Yeah. And we just sort of, we sort of worshipped. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't do anything right. with it. But I, I'm wondering what it is because uh, that's the way we got started. What What does it mean to be progressive? Or you brought up another term I could throw in here: radical. A radical is somebody. Yeah, is? Well, uh, somebody. Well, let me just finish. A radical, is, it, by def definition, is it means it goes to the roots of something rather than the symptoms. So it would go to the causes of something, or first causes, or large ideas, or comprehensive. A radical kind, rather than a a a, a reductionist kind of part of something. You go to a radical. Or a prog what would be a progressive radical? Somebody who's trying to get a hold of a large context of understanding of what's going on. Well, sometimes, sometimes these things are defined more accurately 
by our adversaries. Uh -huh. In other words, a few days ago, I was speaking to a group of students at City College, yeah. and one of them was a former, is a member of the new Black Panthers. And okay. he was telling the story of the way the bureaucracy at City College today tries to stop them from doing their work and from organizing and from forming groups on campus. Yeah. So I told them there is nothing new about that. Years ago, a friend of mine, Jerry Kramer, came to a dean at City College who was very reactionary, the dean of student life. There's another term we could refer to, yeah. reactionary. Yeah, is yeah. Another right. term he came to, to this reactionary, yeah. and he said, Dean Peace, I would like to start a chapter of Americans for Democratic Action oh, yeah. on a campus. Mm -hmm. That's Eleanor Roosevelt's yep. uh, group, mm -hmm. and Arthur Schlesinger's group. Yeah. And Dean Americans Peace looked at him and he said, Jerry, you don't have to start that group because I'm a member. Is, uh, I'm a member of Americans for Democratic Action, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I'm going to start it in a few weeks. Uh -huh. So Jerry went away, and then he investigated, and he found the Dean Peace. It was a total sham, uh -huh. a total deception. Dean Peace was never a member of Americans for Democratic Action, but once he heard that Jerry wanted to start that group uh, on campus, Dean uh, Peace came up with that fabrication. Mm -hmm. And that was a liberal group. So I told this group, it has nothing to do with that you are new Black Panthers. Sometimes your adversaries show you that they want to stand in the way of any progress, All right, whether now, it's liberal or radical. You mean okay, you're defined now, by your adversary? Yeah, progress. What do we? Maybe we could even go to a word like progress. Um, has there? What? What do we mean? Progress. Uh, progress is toward what? I mean, th that's what I'm trying to get at. Where? Do, where do we stand? Where are we? Where is the? the drama of the evolution of universal consciousness yeah. now in terms of this year, 2007, in terms of larger patterns of well, understanding. What are we progressing for? To me, the is progress there any, is... Is there any direction? Is there any purpose? Is there any purpose to life? Is there any purpose yeah. to biological existence? Progress what are we be progressing toward? An These improvement kind of, things, of the human condition. Okay, in other on. words, one moment you don't have health care, the next moment you do have health care. Right. If you do have health care, do you have dentistry and eyeglasses? You know, you should progress to a better human condition. Well, a I'm wondering. Social condition. I wonder if I could throw out just an idea or something. Progressive connotes to my way of thinking in a certain sense. I try to understand it. Conditions that are going to bring benefit to the masses to the greatest number of people rather than highly qualified, a highly uh, specialized kind of benefit to those who are already well established in terms of, let's say, social political order, something like that. It's the thing that's inclusive of everyone and democratic. You use the term democratic and so forth. But it seems to me along those lines, it's something that's going to try and benefit the masses as opposed to those who are already benefiting by the systems that oh, we've inherited out of history. I see. What Does that make any sense? Or? No, but I think I see what you're getting at. Mm. You're, you're thinking of a model where everybody progresses. Well, yeah. Yeah, I would think so, don't you? Yeah, I yeah, would. Because I think you're right. The way you've described it is probably why those that have a lot right now think the only way this could change is if I have less, since I'm already on the top. But are you saying what's really progress is a greater connection and well, a, I think so. a and greater I'm, sharing, like you say, jamming, like a well, like how, how, yeah, it, how, it's, uh, it's jazz musicians or well, that would be like a con. That would be, I think, don't you? I don't know. I'm yeah, just thinking yeah. here and everything like that. But I mean, it's like, um, like for instance, we could take metaphors. I've used it a lot. You might have heard and everything. But like, uh, there there is in the human organism something on the order of a hundred trillion individualized cells. There's liver cells, there's thing, and they're all overlaid with DNA, and they all matter, and they all work as a system, and there's a synergistic resonance, something more than the uh, right. 100 trillion cells that makes you Paula Gloria, that makes you Vasha, right. and they're, 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 that it operates as a system and everyone matters. 
Whereas if you look at the social order, we're coming out of a situation where many of the people have not been able to realize even their full biography, let alone their full potential right. in terms of what's coming out of the evolutionary right. process. Not even a leader of clean water. Not even a leader of clean water. And how can you realize your full potential right. uh, or even your full biography? People die at young right. ages. And, and, so yet the and, scientists, have, and yet the yeah. scientists say that there's a carrying capacity of many times over the population right now. I think that's the case. Yeah, that's yeah. what I love about working with you is well, that the design, the design approach um, that we can support many more people and we don't have this to have this uh, Malthusian attitude that there's not enough and therefore some of us have to go and that's how that's sort of how it is well, how about law that? of the jungle you it, know yeah the law of the jungle seems to be in merging that's the new reality of, you think it, it is a well, new that's reality. the old reality that's the, the law old of the jungle. reality and that kind of thing and that we realize that we're part of an evolutionary process and so forth um, and that we've been here science now we have more understanding we have more understanding we're being able to do more and more with less one of the themes that I'm really interested in is the idea of, at a material level, if um, 200,000 years ago we were wandering around on the Serengeti Plain. Well, you could go back 500 million, six, six, five, six, 500 million years ago, all fauna on Earth was in the form of unicellular spongiform. And there were, there were, there were destined to be evolutionary changes and varieties and things of which and we are contained within. We contain that within us, that thing. And if you were in a steady state system, we would still be in the primordial ooze. There was an impetus to change. That could be progressive. That is an impetus to move out of the primordial ooze up to another lines and variety and so forth. And then there's been the hominoid line along which we come, Australopithecine and Homo habilis, and we get to a point 200,000 years ago where we emerge as a species and that comes as punctuated equilibrium, a new change that comes like that. And are we at a point maybe where we're coming to the end of uh, what we've been for 200,000 years? We're going to come into a new relationship in universe or our relationship to the cosmos? Are we at a point of speciating? Are we at a point of leaving the womb that we've been in for 200,000 years? Are we at a time of qualitative transformation in the evolution of universal consciousness? And if we are, should we not take cognizance of some of those things rather than repairing only to the systems out of which we are emerging, the historical condition out of which we're emerging and that sort of thing? What do you think? Are we at a time of qualitative yeah, change? Well, one of the problems is that a lot of people, it isn't that a lot of people don't know what's right. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know. And, uh, okay, you bring up brilliant people like R. Buckminster Fuller and Louis Old Kelso, but we can even be more simplistic than that and look at the Declaration of Human Ri Rights, Thank you, which is a wonderful Thank you, document Eleanor Roosevelt. written she, by Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. which declares that everyone should have food, shelter, education, and all the basics should be uh, basic human rights, you know. Well, we have the human rights. It's a major document. Yeah, it it's is a in major terms document. of the evolving international law out of just sovereignty yes. at the national level. There's an international law that's emerging. It's getting more and more quality as we move globally and so forth. That's, that's very important. But you'll notice, if you will, that a lot of the people in the world still, after 200,000 years, and a tremendous capability to provide a uh, technologically, intellectually enhanced ability to provide life support, that a lot of the people still do not have enough food, even at that elemental level, mm -hmm. to eat. And there are mothers in Africa that have to decide which of the two babies she's going to let starve to death when we have a system where we know we can produce overwhelmingly the food and all the requirements that may be available to those people. And the systems are not able to realize what we're, cap what we're technologically capable of doing, our systems will not allow us to do for the good of the whole system, much less the ecology, what we know we're capable of doing. It's schizophrenia. Do you understand? Uh, 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 do you understand what I'm saying? That, 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 the, that, that we have a capability that's evolved new, created mm -hmm. a new reality that's already there. But we don't have, we have systems that we're all tied up with in terms of the traditional patterns that are outdated in terms of what the future requires, and we don't have the leadership that brings forth the ideas that allow us to realize our full
potential in a collectivist kind of, an, a, in terms of the whole of the human society, much less the creatures. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but. Yeah, we're in grief. We have yeah. transcendence. We're in grief. What we're, about the We're idea? in grief. It's we're just, in grief. It's just grief. Because, you know, here, here is the means, here is the abundance, and yet you've got strategies and policies where obviously powerful people believe genocide is the order of the day. Well, we do have, don't we? If we just think about it for a minute, we do now have, Monsieur Kaku tells us, we do now have weapon systems, which has been the leading edge of technology development, and it's technology that is what distinguishes us uniquely. We can extend our consciousness into the environment and make the environment other than what, in an Eden-like sense, is given. This is the lot of most of the creatures. We can make the world, and now we have these weapon systems that they tell us, and they can model it, that it really does. I don't know. Is it, is it possible? Maybe I'm wrong, but this is Kaku tells me this, and other people do tell her, some of the others, that those weapon systems, unlike all of 200,000 years of history, we've been hitting each other on the head to get some scarce resources or for whatever reason, that uh, if they were unleashed, it would mean the end, not only of the other tribe and the other village, but the whole species. We now have species lethal weapon systems in this game of war that we've been going, that's been the course of civilization, so-called, for so long, and they're making a new generation of weapon systems now, and the weapons are disseminating, well, and they don't have a vision that could be liberating mm -hmm. of the whole of the human society that would be the adverse side of that destructive scenario. They don't have a vision to liberate the masses of the people because the institutions are all formulated within a condition of scarcity, which has been transcended ontologically in terms of a reality, but we don't have any vision that can allow us to do it because we're tied right. up with old, outdated systems. That's what I'm trying to say. So the progressive thing would be trying to tap into that, or does that make any sense? Or well, how? the place we're in now, m and one of the reasons I love it so much is that it focuses on the average human being yeah. and their qualities and what they have to offer. Right. And you notice one of the failures of our society is that we, we have a society that doesn't focus on individualism or the human being. They're telling us about J-Lo, mm -hmm. about somebody in the New York Yankees. Oh, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, that's who we read about and who we see on the corporate tube. Here at m and we see ordinary people who are struggling to improve their lives. And this makes a great difference. Very often, when I read about Tutankhamun or Norton, <laughs> I think about all some of these tens of thousands of people Pulling who drag <laughs> the stones <laughs> to build the pyramids. That's no, right. but there's no evidence they did I it that way. I wondered what their lives were like. They've yeah. proven that's not possible. Yeah. yeah. They and, did not uh, build the pyramids with slave labor. Yeah, and we want to know how, uh, how the average person in our society <laughs> makes out. Yeah. It's so obvious there is no scarcity here like Buckminster Fuller said. There is no scarcity. With all due respect, I would like to suggest that, if, that, that one of the things is, we've got a chart, if we could bring it up, I don't know if they can. Oh, can we roll but the, the chart? Buckminster Fuller, we well, you roll. can, but uh, the thing is that throughout <coughs> most all of history, I if you could get a measurement, you've got a population There's trend. the chart, Harold. Okay, you got, this is a and chart. He could, and he's got it 50 seconds. He'll zoom in on it if okay, you want to explain well, it. You've got have-nots on the top and ha uh, at the well, bottom. You want to explain it, Harold? Well, I, this is something to consider because he's got, this is Buckminster Fuller, 1952, and this is the chart. You've got a lot of details about how you come to an energy slave availability and so forth, but he's measured and he's, say, he's projecting as a premise that throughout all of human history, there ha it, it's down to zero, it couldn't be zero, but throughout all of human history, there were always more, overwhelmingly more have-nots than haves. And that would be not only in terms of material ability to eat, but also knowledge and knowing and things of that sort that we're getting. And he said that we have, we, he, that we had come up to where, and by 1910, or the First World War, let's say, you'd reached a point where in his reckoning, something on the order of 10% of the world population could be seen to be halves by then. 
coming out of history where there were always overwhelmingly more have-nots. And we were in scarcity. It was a decision. And he said we reached by the Second World War with technology and his reckoning that technology was getting more sophisticated, ability to provide was getting more developed, that we had a situation where something on the order of 20% of the world population could be seen to be haves. And he projected from 1952, from world game, from the best intelligence of bringing together trends and understanding, that we were on a 20-year period, roughly a 20-year period of imminent crisis to all of our human inherited institutions, a 20-year period up to, he projected 1972, when we would cross the 50% mark, and not in terms of the reality, the political existing reality, but in terms of our capability, through good design and through technological capability of providing life support and advancement progression, that we would reach the point where 50% of the world population on this trend would be able to be seen to be haves. Now, you'd have to come to some way of defining what do you mean by a have. Uh, uh, some people think <laughs> you're not a have unless you live in a palace with a swimming pool full of diamonds or something. They got these kind of things. But within some <laughs> sort of a, do you understand? How, what do you mean to be a half? But things like drinking water and all of the things right. that make that up. And so, is, and so in a sense, that would be in a certain sense he, he was postulating and he said we accelerate. We crossed that line about 1970. We crossed the 50% mark where there would be in our terms of our capability more haves and have-nots for the first time in 200,000 years of human evolution. And the trend is going. So that the, 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 the thing is saying that there are, that th through time, the number of people that could be seen to be have through technological advancement and the process, the number of people who could seem to be haves would be increasing on a percentage basis in terms of the world population. And then we crossed that line in 1970. That's about the same line when we crossed the weapons capability that were species lethal. That was about the same year they come up. We couldn't do it in 45. We were impotent. We were mm -hmm. gestating. But we crossed that line about 1970 and that we were transcending scarcity as an ontologic reality out of all 200,000 years of human history collectively. And does it make sense or is it ipso facto absurd, which is the default situation that you find in terms of the way the world is reported upon? that it is never possible for there to be non-scarcity as, as a reality because human desires and human needs are insatiable and there can never be, it's ipso facto to assume that there, you can never have a situation where there is enough, where there is enough and a growing ability to be even an abundant capability for everyone within which our social, economic, political, and thought patterns would be formulated with an understanding that there is enough or the transcending of scarcity. The default situation, the default position is that's impossible. There's no point in thinking about it. It's never brought up. It's never mentioned or anything or never brought up. What do you think about that? Is it possible we could ever have a situation well, that would transcend the ironclad Harold, laws of scarcity? I'd like scarcity? to ask you a question which is interesting. On education, reading, writing, Latin, yeah. digital tech, technologues, what part does that play with being a have and have not? You know, no. at one time, you know, the priests knew Latin, the populace didn't. Right. At one time, you know, uh, we didn't teach uh, Africans how to read, but at one time, scribes were so important, and today we oh. have the digital technologues who could take over, you know. We could find uh, the computers doing everything, including labor. But that's well, good, I think isn't they, it? I, I, what was, that's another issue. Yes. That's another issue to be brought up, and it brings up really big issues. But I wonder, uh, that, that's a huge issue. I mean, because we're being rejoined to nature. We were in nature when we were embedded in mm -hmm. nature on the Serengeti Plain. We perceived the environment multisensorily all at once the way the creatures do. You would mm -hmm. do it extrasensorily. You would uh, do the, and then we started extending our conscience disproportionately sensorily. We extended, we got a tremendous commitment to the eye and to visual uh, through print. Mr. McLuhan said it was a major metaphor for Western rational thinking 
was the stringing out of everything along an alphabetized system Linear. like that. And we're now being rejoined to nature electronically, and we're living electronic, and the youth are living multisensorially all at once in an electronic world. That's happening, they're in advance of things, so there's all that kind of thing that's, that's going on. We're being rejoined to nature, but at a level where we have a knowledge of it, and that's a different, that's a different question. Yet, but the question that comes down to practically is, can techno, th that's the second thing. The first premise is, is it possible, is it possible that we've transcended scarcity, material scarcity as a reality? There was never, it was always scarcity for 200,000 years until 1970. There were always more have not Well, it kind of doesn't matter what we think. It's what's existing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, it doesn't matter what we think. It's, it, it is never mentioned. It's never brought up. It's never thought of as anything other than ipso I know, facto I absurd. Know. Okay? No, when, when I and started... And yet it may have actually transpired, and it would be the biggest shared paradigm shift in the history of mankind. And nobody and knows about it. And it's overlooked. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's overlooked. Yeah. Is it make sense? Can we... Suppose we take that trend, instead of just taking it from 7, 1952 to 72, make that trend and take it out a thousand years if you have to, take it out a hundred years. Are we ever going to transcend scarcity to where there is enough so each of the component parts of the human society have what it is they need not only to survive but to reach their full potentiality in terms of their inner given reality? Are we ever going to have a well-organized thing where everybody is in a certain sense liberated? from a condition where they have to prove their right to eat a piece of bread or something? Maybe that Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. It's but a qualitative maybe, transformation. Maybe we're barking up the is. wrong tree. Okay, talk. Maybe it's not about scarcity. Okay. Maybe it's about security. Okay. And maybe our security um, is falsely perceived to come by uh, owning certain pieces of property or food or, or entitlement to where the food comes from. Maybe it's not about that. Well, I think you're right, don't you? I mean, for one thing, uh, if you that say the robots are going to take over, yes, and I would think that that's a very real possibility. Yes, and that they should. And of course, of course, they the should business, free us. The business uh, sector also, you know, the profit motive. I mean, there seems to be just a demand for profit, earning capital, and total. Uh, uh, they're totally unconcerned about the people who cannot afford uh, these uh, goods. Yeah, except, you know, Mr. Ruther used to worry about the fact that he could turn out these cars and everything, but he said to Mr. Ruther, said to Mr. Ford, so how are the people going to buy the products that you can turn Oh, I mean, that's another issue. That's an economic issue on how we're going to oh, form capital. Oh, it's kind of like a monopoly game? How you're going to form capital and how much capital you're going to have available to do what you're technologically capable of doing and how are you going to distribute income. I mean, that's another issue. The major premise is, is it impossible? Why is it never, or is the idea of there being enough? That we reached a point where it's the adverse side of the destructive scenario well, I think uh, there is enough materially I, I for everyone and within the bounds of a that a qualitative transformation has taken place in terms of the reality. And we do not address it. We don't recognize it because it's very... When they went through going to Copernicus and that came and they, they, they went away from... You had Hieronymus Bosch. It was anxiety writ large when they discovered that this was not well. the center of the universe. It really was upsetting to people's identity. So if you go through a thing where you're going to ups get rid of the institutions that have been formulated within a condition of where people had to earn the right to eat, you have all these Buddhist ethics, Puritan ethic, all the ethics that were intrinsic to a condition of there not being enough and so forth, and the work ethic and so forth. People got their identity by what they do. I'm a bus driver. I'm a teacher. I'm a this. I'm a that. And is that all being threatened, or the oh. means by which Harold, people get well, a sense that's of why identity we're so critical by of capitalism? That's why mm -hmm. the progressives are so critical of the capitalist system. Thank you. Tell me that. So, for instance, mm -hmm. in uh, Cuba, yeah. we all know, even the critics who I have dinner with, <laughs> tell me their mother-in-laws and father-in-laws who live in Cuba 
have free transportation, there is no rent, there is no cost for medical or dental treatment, and there is no cost for education, mm -hmm. even higher education. Mm -hmm. Even medical school is free in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So they have a different system. And they say they're following a socialistic or communistic system, okay. another economic but, but, system. But okay. Josh, right. and, Josh okay. and Harold, yeah. I haven't had a chance to ask Joe Friendly this question. Why is Guantanamo Bay in Cuba? I don't know. It has something to do with the, I don't know, we did treaty. the Maine. Was it's a, a treaty. treaty going back to taking the Maine or the, remember the Maine and the charge up San Juan Hill yes. and that kind of thing? I don't know. When we established Isn't that kind of strange? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that are strange. No, but Josh, what do you think? Why is Guantanamo Bay in Cuba? Well, it, it was a treaty that the previous governments had in Cuba, and you remember that a lot of previous governments were much more friendlier to uh, the United States than Castro was, Mr. and Batista. so on. But and uh, can I can I propose something? Yeah, sure, go ahead. When you have false flag terror going on, you need a patsy. You need something to blame it on. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say a country's having the food, it's having everything taken care of. That's the same way Mohammed Atta was treated, and and uh, Oswald, and uh, you know the patsies. I'm very suspicious, and I'm out there in TV land. Email me at the end of this. There'll be my email. Mm -hmm. If anyone can give me a good reason, I'd like to know why is Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. I just put it out. Well, okay. It's a, it's a detention facility, a piece of land that is exterritoriality controlled by the United States through historical... Yeah, but it just uh, seems really strange to me. We're controlling a prison, and everybody's upset about all the torture going on. That implies that we can stop the torture going on. That implies that we can get into that country. There's something, something seems strange to me. Th does it to you, Josh? Well, I'm sure people will be able to answer that. I, I don't Josh, quite understand. Josh, do you, you know? Mean, you mean about why... Guantanamo yeah. Bay is in Cuba? Right. Well, uh, the United States is a very domineering uh, power in the, atm in the hemisphere. And, uh, well, are the Cubans torturing these people? No. Who's no. the American Who's prison camp? It's no, an American that, military that's prison camp. That's an isolated, uh, fortified uh, section of Cuba. But it just, seem, it just seems to me if we have the power to say torture or not torture, we would have the power to do anything else, in which case we're living a little bit uh, in an illusion here. Well, I, th I think we're living in huge illusions. In, in so Let's talk about that. Oh, a huge illusion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that we were just talking about. The one I suggested is that all that other stuff would be, it seems to me, subsumed in this general question of is it possible that we have transcended material scarcity or not? If, a, sci if a, a scientist thing? says he's measured this, he's measured that, and the resources are there, and mm -hmm. yet people are struggling and suffering, mm -hmm. then the question is, why are those who have power feeling that they can't share. That, to me, is a more interesting question. Do, do we, do, are we able to come to an agreement? Or, or you don't like the word sharing, because that's I, moral. I, I, I like not, how you say that, that in, a, nothing, in a design. No, I'm nothing against morality. Well, no, you, but you say it's not that you should be good, or you should share, or you should, there sh you know, I, I was always attracted when I'd listen to your shows talking about that the institutions haven't caught up to the reality right. that scarcity has been transcended. Right, well, just, and if you therefore, say that. it's not a moral consideration. It'll just be a function of this reality descending, but what does it take to present it? Well, I have nothing against morality. I think morality and ethics and that in justice. It we just, should, we, if we're progressive, we want to be for justice. But you just, we want justice for everybody. We want uh, caring. We want I, empathy. I, we want all these things. And that's all very, very good. And people, our spiritual leaders, have been telling us that ever since forever. Jesus right, and but, Buddha but and everybody, and it's been roundly ignored by the political class. It doesn't work. It doesn't, no, it, it's roundly ignored. It's not convenient by <laughs> Well, them. that essentially doesn't work. But if it's ignored, it's not working. <coughs> it's not working except You've got on the depleted margin. uranium and you have these vaccinations yeah. that, that hurt you and more. And we're at a point, just, oh. it, it's getting to be where I'm not sure it's able to be just left up to the fellas to play with their toys anymore. You know, because it's now species lethal. 
It's no longer where they can just beat, like Bafia Dons, beat up and take over the territory <laughs> on the north side or something. It's species lethal weapons that can wipe us all out. You said that three out. times. All right. Uh, Go on. Uh, and that's a new reality. I think w I know. Yeah. And it's not I going know backwards. what the problem here is. So I'm listening. You know, as a radical, yeah. there has yourself, to be a discussion yeah. of who creates the wealth. So we believe the workers and the people create the wealth. But that doesn't mean the capitalist class is totally selfish because there are tremendous endowments that they have in this society. Like Annenberg builds all these wonderful wings, the Delacorte Theater. We know this project that Bill Gates uh, took part in earlier last yeah, year. Yeah donating billions of dollars. Carnegie libraries but, all over the country. The trouble with the Carnegie. philosophy is that they feel it's theirs to share and theirs to give. Mm -hmm. But if you're a radical, mm -hmm. you believe that this is the people's wealth to begin with, mm -hmm. and they really have no entitlement to it, and that they really didn't earn it, the and they didn't create it. The yeah. capitalists, yeah. yes. So that's a part of what would yeah. be called progressive yeah. Yeah. or left or no, something. And radical. so they would be more inclined to what you call socialist and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. That kind of thinking. And they were informed in large measure by Karl Marx mm -hmm. and some of the socialist is, thinkers and so forth. Is wealth labor-based? Uh, well, that's one of the some of their questions that could be addressed. And then the indigenous peoples even throw us off more when they say, how can you own land? How can anyone own land? Well, it's, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they have that view, and, and I, yeah, that, that kind of a thing. So that's yeah. a big, big question. Yeah. You got two questions, really. You got the questions of uh, scarcity or not, or what the reality is. And the other thing is, what are the relations between the people? And it seems to me that the, the, the socialist thing is that they, they uh, the input to production, if you talk about production, if you're talking materialistic world, you're not necessarily talking about the spirit world or something like that. That's a thing that's maybe put off. No, if the we, material world, trees and yeah, well, yeah, energy and, uh, from right, resources. Right, and, and they've got all these systems that they've understood. Maybe we're coming to a time of transcending our relationship to universal consciousness that may or may not have a pattern to it. We don't know. There's been a lot of projections about what the universe is all about on full you know, spiritual terms. They understand the whole universe. We don't. We're evolving. We're coming into a new relationship, and it's a priori mystery. We get to another level, we'll have another relationship to it, but we don't know. Now we're in the womb. We don't know what the universe is outside of a priori mystery, and we may get to a point where we'll be in a higher relationship to, to, to that evolutionary pattern, but we're not there. But the thing, they we're not there now, we're in the womb. We're about to leave the womb. Where if we get it so that the whole system, like an organism, is operating and everybody is able to realize their, and we're able to realize our full potentiality for everyone, like people jamming in an orchestra. And everybody's doing it the way they feel. Yeah, and uh, the what's for them? And they're and if you're if you're in a music, you want the guy next to you to play the best he possibly can. And if you right. got if you got everybody living right. that, there would be a synergy or a resonancy more than the sum of the parts. There's something right. more than the sum of the parts of a system that is resonancy. And string theory tells us there's nothing in the universe but resonance, right. or beyond right. that. So anyway, but the thing is that we're, the question comes down to. Are the, out, are the systems and the system, let's say, the United States is superpower, that kind of thing, that they assume of as being historically legitimate for the end of time, we can establish it in all the world. I just had a program a couple of days ago with Dai Min, and she was talking about how we got a system that's the best ever. It can be fixed. It can be changed and everything like that. Or is there a new qualitative transformation that's needed for us to realize the potentialities that the inherited institutions that we have are we an enjant regime? What's enjant? Uh, enjant regime means old order, the order that's been in place. For a thousand years after Rome, you had an enjant regime. Everybody got their identity by dynastic states and so forth. Oh. Is ours a 230-year-old enjant regime tied into the idea of how we're going to form our society, form capital, how we're going to distribute income and so forth, and we're outdated and we need something new and we don't have a vision 
of, uh, of, uh, of what the future requires because we haven't even latched on to the first principle of qualitative transformation that has occurred that we've transcended scarcity, then how are we going to form capital? How are we going to make the decisions on feasibility studies, mixing both private and public sector ideas of what the trends and possibilities are? Connections of empathy. And how are we going to distribute income to when the, the technological instruments are responsible for the production, the, the, the squeaky, capital instruments, the squeaky rather violin. than the labor? The, the labor. The squeaky well, violin. We're, we're mm -hmm. rather young. I mean, everyone, all historians agree that this regime is very young. I mean, compared to Egypt or Rome or the African civilizations, we are very young. Well, I would submit so, yeah, that we're on our way out. I would submit <laughs> that the system the United States is, in a certain sense, with full spectrum dominance trying to impose upon the world, is in fact an enjeant regime. It's out of touch with what the requirements of the future are because we have institutions and thought patterns that were built within a context that has ontologically been superseded by a new reality. Feudalism and agriculture was superseded by industrialism. We're post-industrial. We have been, the, uh, the context of the, of the planetary evolution of events and so forth has been, sup the, the context we set up 230 years ago has been superseded and we're caught up with old, outdated ideas like how everybody's got to earn their right to live and who's going to own the capital assets that are increasingly responsible for production. And the major premise of all the theoretical economics, which informs politics, is the labor theory of value. And it doesn't matter if you're a Marxist or a laissez-faire. So you're questioning you know. if wealth comes from labor. Yeah, no, I'm saying that it has been transformed. In, in Thomas, maybe we got another chart if they can bring it up. We're ranting here. Yeah. But oh, in Tom Jefferson's day one. in America, there was only something like maybe, they maybe can zoom 10 percent. 10 percent of the production was anything other yeah. than labor. This chart. Yeah. No, that's a more a general theory thing that if would subsume uh, Keynesian in that. But no, that chart's going to be relevant to a show I'm going to have next week or the week after, because at the 9-11 Accountability yeah. Conference in Arizona, a mm -hmm. man named what Walter you, Bruyan uh, yeah, you was talking me. about the trading that was going on. Do you think this system will persevere despite the fact that the demographics will change okay, now in here, the this society. Is the, this is the chart. Let, take it back he a little bit, to. guys, if you can. Okay. okay. This is a chart, and if you look over to the, what is it? Changing participation it, it of labor It goes from workers. 1776, that's over to the left side of the screen. That's right? here? No, mm -hmm. the left side, yeah. And 1776, and you got a, a sloping chart, okay? Okay. There. And you can see that that's 1990. Uh, no, 17. It goes. This is this is this is present. goes to 2000. This is 1776. So the okay. move of history is that way. All okay. Right? And in 1776, you had no mass production. You had nothing. It was practically all labor. And there were people who had labor. You had to cut down a tree with a hatchet. Now, if, in the input to now keep it on the chart. I don't care because you, you were do. changing it. You have to hold it steady here. Okay. Okay. So you want you're showing this. Yeah. Now what just trending is the input between on one side labor, Where's and by labor you mean all human activity. Okay? okay. And on the other side is everything else. Plutarchus. That would be with land. That would be with technology. That would be with capital instruments. And that would be the trend in the American economy as a mentor economy for the world. That's the way the world is going. What is happening is labor, and that's not just wheelbarrows. That's labor, mental and intellectual, uh, intellectual and physical input to production. It is less and less human activity that is responsible for production, and it's more and more technology and systems that are um, not responsible. And yet we distribute all income to the masses. Ask anybody other than a few people in down on Wall Street, how do you get income to live? And they will say, well, you have a job. You have a labor relationship to production. And they assume the full emplo the Employment Act of 1946 is our basic policy grounding statement. And all income is distributed to the masses of the people by their labor. They're like what Marxists call it wage labor, slaves, wage slaves. Mm -hmm. And the situation and the way in which the production is achieved is less and less labor and is more and more technological instruments or other things other than labor. 
And those things are usually represented in what they call corporate stock or capital assets. And the capital assets are all owned by a tiny plutocratic class of people with a little bit of, uh, you know, like that. And they accept the idea that it's perfectly all right for a small group of people to set the template for everybody else, set the template for everybody else, and we're all picking up leaves on their estate, in a sense. And Does that make you angry? No, it, it's not that it makes you angry. It's so inefficient and it's so out of touch with what's but required. And it's based upon a, a blinkered view of economics that blinkers not only the left or the right, but, but also the progressives but because they think it's perfectly all right to distribute who income. Who thinks it's perfectly all right? The, the, people, the people who are socialist. Or people I, that believe, I the Marxists think, or I don't the progressives, think they, they believe in this idea of the labor theory of value, because, and that's so easy to think because that's people are getting their attention. We're going to have to have some way to include the masses of the people in the ownership of capital instruments and technology that is producing wealth as a way not only of forming capital, what we're able to do, give us a chance to do what we're fully capable of doing, but distributing income How? to the masses, and then that's going to liberate them from having to be wage slaves and liberate them to do what it is that they want to do from inside, like playing in an orchestra, or be liberated, uh, rather than all do being think dependent the upon this. Do you think demographics will have any impact on this society? For instance, women having more empowerment, uh, people of color, uh, the population rising in our society, you think that'll have any impact? on what's going on? Or do you think the small class will uh, persevere regardless of what happens with our demographics in the this oligarchy? society? The oligarchy? Yeah, the well, oligarchy. We, 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 what, what we have to do, with my suggestion is, I mean, the book I like in terms of the practical realities is not the Communist Manifesto, it's the capitalist manifesto. There's wow. about three editions in all the world. Wow. But that's really There's radical. There's a capitalist manifesto? Yeah, it was written by Lewis, Kelso, and Mortimer Adler, America's preeminent philosopher. Mm -hmm. And they've got, instead of saying you have to do, you have to get everybody employed, it's what you have to, you have to democratize ownership of technological instruments by the masses mm -hmm. so that that's not only a way of forming more capital for us to do what we're collectively able to, but also by the fact that they have a, a private property, ownership right, mm -hmm. of technology, that they then have a stream of income that has nothing to do with what they do. You'll end up with a population of people that have a steady stream of income to live well and even affluently meet the problems of the technology uh, the, the technology can provide in terms of giving us life support for the whole system, and then people are going to be free from having to earn a living, and people are going to be free to be able to pursue their own mm. muse. You and people are, and they would say, that's anarchy. And the people that are in the position, you're going to let people be free? We're all, it's like we need Frederick Douglass. We live in a system of slavery. It's a system of slavery now, and you're going to have to free the human spirit to be concerned <laughs> with the things that really matter, and then they will get together like fellows in an orchestra, not because somebody's ordering them to go there. They won't have their whole life dictated by some template set up by a few people who own everything, keeping it all to themselves. You would have a democratization of the human spirit and a renaissance of the human spirit which would allow people to do what it is, is there, what they want to do rather than what they have to do in order to have the right to have something to buy a loaf of bread to eat something like they have to do now. So what I'm saying is... Maybe the, people like slavery. Perhaps. That's you know, another once issue. Once I did a show called mm. Sex, Slavery, and the White House in, you said something about in, that today, in, in, in August of 2000, and Frank Craven was hosting it with me, and we were talking about an ex-sex slave who got over mind control, government-imposed mind control. And then we took call-ins, and you can imagine, is there sex slavery in the White House? It's provocative, so, mm -hmm. so the, it was lighting up in the control room. Yeah. Mo Molly was handling it with Alan. Mm. And there was one caller, I remember getting it, and I just, in, internally I was just freaking out, because this guy goes, yeah, I dig it. Well, you had uh, Marquis. So what Marquis. could I say, you know? Well, yeah, you got Some people get off on... You have strange things in Marquis de Sade, but what we're talking about is people <laughs> being able to... But I mean, we have to take that into account. 
Well, you, well, you can take that into account. Otherwise, we're just sort of saying you can't feel this way and you must be that way. If, no, what if you want to do is, is make it be that people can be the way they want to be. Well, like and you, it was somebody you says, were you saying, go here, but when you, you say, I don't want to go here, I want to go over here where it feels right. I'm yeah. with my fellows. I'm yeah. doing it right. And it's love and all the most important things. You can't buy me. Right. They're going to be free okay. from having to be up, everybody up for sale for somebody who has it. And the way to do it, it seems to me, is to uh, maybe not. Maybe well, socialism maybe, is the way to do it. But go. maybe it's just you a just socialize everything, well. do it through government. But there's a lot of private sector do you capability feel that I think is part of it. Do you feel enslaved in this uh, I feel restrained. You do. By, How about but you, not Josh? personally. Well, profit, do you feel, do you feel uh, enslaved? I think one of the things that inhibits this system the most is what they call profiteering. So, for instance, like uh, 25 years ago. I bought a beautiful Hong Kong bike in a top-notch store for thirty-five dollars. Uh -huh. Now it's about three, four hundred dollars. Uh -huh. Well, look the what happened bike? to uh, sneakers, hundreds uh -huh. of dollars, or roller skates. I used to go in the five and ten, buy roller skates for five, six, eight dollars. Now it's <gasps> hundreds of dollars. Or Coenzyme yeah. uh, Ten Pro used to be cheap. Now. Wow. Everyone's discovering that it's a fortune, $32, yeah. $42. Yeah. I so, sunbathe because I mean, vitamin D so is... So profiteering <laughs> seems yeah. to have an impact on everything. Well, yeah. And, uh, but if we get through good design, we can have things... Good and design. cable. Cable is going yeah. up, too. Well, Ooh, cable. Well, yeah. No, cable. Wow. yeah, but, I mean, if the market is able to be there and everything is a, a liberating order, but we got to get... It's just a, quali a time of qualitative trends when we need something new. And I don't think the history. I think this labor theory of value has to be attacked. We, do you know that yeah. airplanes are safer if they have no pilot? <laughs> Triple redundancy. Really? And yeah. we're coming. Do you ever, you want to have somebody checking? You want to do the labor thing? Well, you want to create labor for so people there you to go. do things like pulling the, yeah. the pyramids? I think the White did House that. is safer if it had no you president. You don't want. You want <laughs> to have. You want to have. You have safe. You can have. You can. You, you know, if you could do a thing where you could create productive capability. And you don't have to have a lot of people doing things in there in order to earn a living. Half the population of the United States is pushing cash registers against the other half in order to build up the profits. You need to have a liberating order, it seems to Watch me. Watch my show on Walter Burian. It was fascinating. I will. I when went, is it airing? Oh, I can't remember which day, but in the weeks to come very soon from my Arizona bit. Okay. Go, yeah, that got a report on that. Yeah. Sorry. Listen, we got all carried away and everything like that. But listen, I don't know. It's my thinking. I got this idea. I think these are some ideas that are, yeah, are relevant the to the ideas. way the world has to go. And I think, are you optimistic, pessimistic for the human prospect? I'm optimistic for myself. You're for your, well, for the human <laughs> prospect. Are you oh, optimistic yeah, of or pessimistic? I'm, uh, I'm optimistic, and all my friends are optimistic. They say man and woman have been here for so long, and we can uh, continue be here, and we're going to find a way. Email I would say, me. well, I would like to be. I would, I would say the, uh, the, the <laughs> li most likely, likely, I would say that where we're heading now without some sort of a wake-up call was that we're going to blow the whole thing up. I think they're heading to blow the whole thing up. I and mean, it's yeah, very distressing. Yeah. Okay. It's distressing. Well, that's good. I too. think they're probably going to destroy it.